Hello, my name is Mrs Ingham and I'm a receptionist and admin clerk. I'm reading chapter 11. A couple of people in the blue hooded robes came around after Ramus two bellies selling gifts. There was some really cool stuff, like chocolate models of the nuts and bolts that Ramus ate, and rubber dolls of Alexander ribs which you could bend and stretch. And there were clippings of the wolfman's hair. I bought a bit of that. It was tough and wiry, sharp as a knife. There will be more novelties later, Mr. Tall announced from the stage, so don't spend all your money right away. How much is the glass statue? Steve asked. It was the same sort that Ramus two bellies had eaten. The person in the blue hood didn't say anything, but stuck out a sign with the price on. I can't read, Steve said. Will you tell me how much it costs? I stared at Steve and wondered why he was lying. The person in the hood still didn't speak. This time, he or she shook his head quickly and moved on before Steve could ask anything else. What was that about, I asked. Steve shrugged. I wanted to hear, to hear it speak, he said, to see if it was human or not. Of course it's human, I said. What else could it be? I don't know, he said. That's why I was asking. Don't you think it's strange that they keep their faces covered all the time? Maybe they're shy, I said. Maybe, he said, but I could tell he didn't believe that. When the people selling the gifts were finished, the next freak came on. It was the bearded lady, and at first I thought it was meant to be a joke, because she didn't have a beard. Mr. Tall stood behind her and said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special act. Truska here is new to our family. She is one of the most incredible performers I have ever seen, with a truly unique talent. Mr. Tall walked off. Truska was very beautiful, dressed in flowing red robes which had many slashes and gaps. Lots of the men in the theatre began to cough and shift around in their seats. Truska stepped closer to the edge of the stage so we could see her better, then said something that sounded like a seal barking. She put her hands on her face, one at either side, and stroked the skin gently. Then she held her nose shut with two fingers and tickled her chin with the other hand. An extraordinary thing happened. She began to grow a beard. Hairs crept out, first on her chin, then her upper lip, then the sides of her face, finally all over. It was long and blonde and straight. It grew about 10 or 11 centimetres, then stopped. She took her fingers away from her nose and stepped down into the crowd, where she walked around and let people pull on the beard and stroke it. The beard continued growing as she walked, until finally it reached down to her feet. When she arrived at the rear of the theatre, she turned and walked back to the stage. Even though there was no breeze in here, her hair blew about wildly, tickling people's faces as she passed. When she was back on the stage, Mr Tall asked if anybody had a pair of scissors. Lots of women did. Mr Tall invited a few up. The Cirque du Freak will give one solid bar of gold to anyone who can slice off Truska's beard, he said, and held up a small yellow ingot to show he wasn't joking. That got a lot of people excited, and for ten minutes nearly everybody in the theatre tried cutting off her beard. But they couldn't. Nothing could cut through the bearded lady's hair, not even a pair of garden shears, which Mr Tall handed out. The funny thing was, it still felt soft just like ordinary hair. When everyone had admitted defeat, Mr Tall emptied the stage and Truska stood in the middle again. She stroked her cheeks as before and held her nose, but this time the beard grew back in. It took about two minutes for the hairs to disappear back inside and then she looked exactly as she had when she first came out. She left a huge applause and the next act came on almost directly after. His name was Hans Hans. He began by telling us about his father, who'd been born without legs. Hans's father learned to get around on his hands just as well as other people could on their feet and had taught his children his secrets. Hans then sat down, pulled up his legs and wrapped his feet around his neck. He stood on his hands, walked up and down the stage, then hopped off and challenged four men picked at random to a race. They could race on their feet. He'd race on his hands. He promised a bar of gold to anyone who could beat him. 
they used the aisles of the theatre as a racetrack, and despite his disadvantage, Hans beat the four men easily. He claimed he could sprint 100 metres in eight seconds on his hands, and nobody in the theatre doubted him. Afterwards, he performed some impressive gymnastic feats, proving that a person could manage just as well without legs as with them. His act wasn't especially exciting, but it was enjoyable. There was a short pause after Hans had left. Then Mr. Tall came on. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, our next act is another unique and perplexing one. It can also be quite dangerous, so I ask that you make no noise and do not clap until you are told it is safe. The whole place went quiet. After what had happened with the wolfman earlier, nobody needed telling twice. When it was quiet enough, Mr. Tall walked off the stage. He shouted out the name of the next freak as he went, but it was a soft shout. Mr. Krepsley and Madam Octa. The lights went down low and a creepy looking man walked onto the stage. He was tall and thin with very white skin and only a small crop of orange hair on the top of his head. He had a large scar running down his left cheek. It reached to his lips and made it look like his mouth was stretching up the side of his face. He was dressed in dark red clothes and carried a small wooden cage, which he put on a table. When he was set, he turned and faced us. He bowed and smiled. He looked even scarier when he smiled. Like a crazy clown in a horror movie I once saw. Then he started to explain about the act. I missed the first part of his speech because I wasn't looking at the stage. I was watching Steve. You see, when Mr. Krepsley walked out, there had been total silence except for one person who had gasped loudly, Steve. I stared curiously at my friend. He was almost as white as Mr. Krepsley and was shaking all over. He'd even dropped the rubber model of Alexander Ribs that he'd brought. His eyes were fixed on Mr. Krepsley, as though glued to him. And as I watched him watch the freak, the thought which crossed my mind was, he looks like he's seen a ghost. Hi, I'm Miss Light. I'm Head of English. I'm going to be reading Chapter 12. It is not true that all tarantulas are poisonous, Mr Krepsley said. He had a deep voice. I managed to tear my eyes away from Steve and train them on the stage. Most are as harmless as the spiders you find anywhere in the world. And those which are poisonous normally only have enough poison in them to kill very small creatures. But some are deadly, he went on. Some can kill a man with one bite. They are rare and only found in extremely remote areas, but they do exist. I have one such spider, he said, and opened the door of the cage. For a few seconds, nothing happened. But then the largest spider I had ever seen crawled out. It was green and purple and red with long hairy legs and a big fat body. I wasn't afraid of spiders but this one looked terrifying. The spider walked forward slowly then its legs bent and it lowered its body as though waiting for a fly. Madame Octa has been with me for several years Mr Krepsley said. She lives far longer than ordinary spiders the monk who sold her to me said some of her kind lived to be 20 or 30 years old. She is an incredible creature, both poisonous and intelligent. While he was speaking, one of the blue hooded people led a goat onto the stage. It was making a frightened bleating noise and kept trying to run. The hooded person tied it to the table and left. The spider began moving when it saw and heard the goat. It crept to the edge of the table, where it stopped, as if awaiting an order. Mr Krepsley produced a shiny tin whistle. He called it a flute, from his trouser pocket and blew a few short notes. Madame Otter immediately leaped through the air and landed on the goat's neck. The goat gave a leap when the spider landed and began bleating loudly. Madame Otter took no notice hung on and moved a few centimetres closer to the head. When she was ready, she bared her fangs and sunk them deep into the goat's neck. The goat froze and its eyes went wide. 
It stopped bleating and a few seconds later toppled over. I thought it was dead, but then realised it was still breathing. This flute is how I control, Madame Octa, Mr Krebsy said. And I looked away from the fallen goat. He waved the flute slowly above his head. Though we have been together such a long time, she is not a pet and would surely kill me if I ever lost it. The goat is paralysed, he said. I have trained Madame Octa not to kill outright with her first bite. The goat would die in the end if we left it. There is no cure for Madame Octa's bite, but we shall finish it quickly. He blew on the flute and Madame Octa moved up the goat's neck and she will, till she was standing on its ear. She bared her fangs again and bit. The goat shivered, then went totally still. It was dead. Madame Octa dropped from the goat and crawled towards the front of the stage. The people in the front rows became very alarmed and some jumped to their feet, but they froze at a short command from Mr Krepsley. Do not move, he hissed. Remember your earlier warning. A sudden noise could mean death. Madame Octa stopped at the edge of the stage, then stood on her two back legs, the same as a dog. Mr Krepsley blew softly on his flute and she began walking backwards, still on two feet. When she reached the nearest leg of the table, she turned and climbed up. You will be safe now, Mr Krepsley said, and the people in the front rows sat down again, as slowly and quietly as they could. But please, he added, do not make any loud noises, because if you do, she might come after me. I don't know if Mr Krepsley was really scared or if it was part of the act, but he looked frightened. He wiped the sleeve of his right arm over his forehead, then placed the flute back in his mouth and whistled a strange little tune. Madame Octa cocked her head, then appeared to nod. She crawled across the table until she was in front of Mr Krepsley. He lowered his right hand and she crept up his arm. The thought of those long, hairy legs creeping along his flesh made me sweat all over, and I liked spiders. People who were afraid of them must have been nervously chewing the insides of their cheeks to pieces. When she got to the top of his arm, she scuttled along his shoulder, up his neck, over his ear, and didn't stop until she reached the top of his head, where she lowered her body. She looked like a funny sort of hat. After a while, Mr Krepsley began playing the flute again. Madame Octa slid down the other side of his face, along the scar, and walked along until she was standing upside down on his chin. Then she spun a string of web and dropped down on it. She was hanging about 10 centimetres below his chin now and slowly began rocking from side to side. Soon she was swinging about level with his ears. Her legs were tucked in and from where I was sitting, she looked like a ball of wool. Then as she made an upward swing, Mr Krepsley threw his head back and she went flying straight up into the air. The thread snapped and she tumbled around and around. I watched her go up, then come down. I thought she'd land on the floor or the table, but she didn't. Instead, she landed in Mr Krepsley's mouth. I nearly got sick when I thought of Madame Octa sliding down his throat and into his belly. I was sure she'd bite him and kill him. But the spider was a lot smarter than I knew. As she was falling, she'd stuck her legs out and they had caught on his lips. He brought his head forward so we could see his face. His mouth was wide open and Madame Octa was hanging between his lips. Her body throbbed in and out of his mouth and she looked like a balloon which he was blowing up and letting the air out of. I wondered where the flute was and how he was going to control the spider now. Then Mr Tall appeared with another flute. He couldn't play as well as Mr Krepsler, but he was good enough to make Madame Octa take notice. She listened, then moved from one side of Mr Krepsler's mouth to the other. I didn't know what she was doing at first, so I craned my neck to see. When I saw the bits of white on Mr Krepsler's lips, I understood. She was spinning a web. 
When she was finished, she lowered herself from his chin, like she had before. There was a large web spun across Mr. Krepsley's mouth. He began chewing and licking the web. He ate the whole of it, then rubbed his belly, being careful not to hit Madame Octa, and said, delicious, nothing tastier than fresh spider webs. They are a treat where I come from. He made Madame Octa push a ball across the table, then got her to balance on top of it. He set up small pieces of gym gear, tiny weights and ropes and rings, and put her through her paces. She was able to do all the things a human could, like lift weights above her head and climb ropes and pull herself up on the rings. Then he brought out a tiny dinner set. There were mini plates and knives and forks and teeny weeny glasses. The plates were filled with dead flies and other small insects. I don't know what was in the glasses. Madame Octa ate that dinner as neatly as you please. She was able to pick up the knives and forks four at a time and feed herself. There was even a fake salt cellar which she sprinkled all over one of the dishes. It was round about the time she was drinking from the glass that I decided Madame Octa was the world's most amazing pet. I would have given everything I owned for her. I knew it could never be. Mum and Dad wouldn't let me keep her even if I could buy her. But that didn't stop me from wishing. When the act was over, Mr Krepsley put the spider back in her cage and bowed low while everybody clapped. I heard a lot of people saying it wasn't fair to have killed the poor goat, but it had been thrilling. I turned to Steve to tell him how, I, how great I thought the spider was, but he was watching Mr Krepsley. He didn't look scared anymore, but he didn't look normal either. Steve, what's wrong? I asked. He didn't answer. Steve? Shh, he snapped and wouldn't say another word until Mr Krepsley had left. He watched the odd-looking man walk back to the wings. Then he turned to me and gasped. This is amazing! The spider, I asked. It was great. How do you think... I'm not talking about the spider, he snapped. Who cares about a silly old arachnid? I'm talking about Mr Krepsley. He paused before saying the man's name, as though he'd been about to call him something different. Mr. Krepsler, I asked, confused. What was so great about him? All he did was play the flute. You don't understand, Steve said angrily. You don't know who he really is. And you do, I asked. Yes, he said. As a matter of fact, I do. He rubbed his chin and started looking worried again. I just hope he doesn't know I know. If he does, we might never make it out of here alive. Hi, Year 7. My name's Mrs Fairbrother. Um, I'm the Health and Wellbeing Officer from school. I can't wait to meet you all when you start. But for now, I'm going to be reading Chapter 13 of Cirque de Freak, and I really hope you enjoy it. There was another break after Mr Krepsley and Madame Octa's act. I tried getting Steve to tell me more about who the man was, but his lips were sealed. All he said was, I have to think about this. Then he closed his eyes, lowered his head and thought hard. They were selling more cool stuff during the break. Beards like the bearded ladies, model of Hans Hans, and best of all, rubber spiders which looked like Madame Octa. I bought two, one for me and one for Annie. They weren't as good as the real thing, but they'd have to do. They were also selling candy webs. I bought six of those using up the last of my money and ate two while I was waiting for the next freak to come out. They tasted like candy floss. I stuck the second one over my lips and licked at it the same way Mr. Krepsley had. The lights went down and everybody settled back into their seats. Gertha Teeth was next up. She was a big woman with a thick legs, thick arms, a thick neck and a thick head. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Gertha Teeth, she said. She sounded strict. I have the strongest teeth in the world. When I was a baby, my father put his fingers in my mouth playing with me and I bit two of them off. A few people laughed, but she stopped them with a furious look. 
I am not a comedian, she snapped. If you laugh at me again, I will come down and bite off your nose. That sounded quite funny, but nobody dared chuckle. She spoke very loudly. Every sentence was a shout and ended up an exclamation mark. Dentists all over the world have been astounded by my teeth, she said. I've been examined in every major dental centre, but nobody has been able to work out why they are so tough. I've been offered huge amounts of money to become a guinea pig, but I like travelling and so I have refused. She picked up four steel bars, each about 30 centimetres long, but different widths. She asked for volunteers and four men went up on stage. She gave each of them a bar and said to try bending them. They did their best, but weren't able. When they had failed, she took the thinnest bar, put it in her mouth and bit clean through it. She handed the two halves back to one of the men. He stared at them in shock, then put one end in his own mouth and bit on it to check if it was real steel. His howls when he almost cracked his teeth proved that it was. Gertha did the same to the second and third bars, each of which was thicker than the first. When it came to the fourth, the thickest of the lot, she chewed it into pieces like a chocolate bar. Next, two of the blue hooded assistants brought out a large radiator and she bit holes in it. They then gave her a bike and she gnashed it up into a little ball, tires and all. I don't think there were anything in the world Gertha Teeth wouldn't chew her way through if she'd set her mind to it. She called more volunteers up on stage. She gave one a sledgehammer and a large chisel, one a hammer and a smaller chisel, and the other an electric saw. She lay flat on her back and put the large chisel on in her mouth. She nodded at the first volunteer to swing the sledgehammer at the chisel. The man raised the sledgehammer high above his head and brought it down. I thought he was going to smash a face open, and so did lots of others, judging by the gas and people covering their hands with their eyes. But Gertha was no fool. She swung out of the way, and the sledgehammer slammed into the floor. She sat up out of the way and snorted. Ha! How crazy do you think I am? One of the blue hoods came out and took the sledgehammer from the man. I only called you up to show you the sledgehammer is real, she told him. Now, she said to those of us in the audience, watch. She lay back again and stuck the chisel in her mouth. The blue hood waited a moment, then raised the sledgehammer high and swung it down faster and harder than the man had. It struck the top of the chisel and there was a fierce noise. Gertha sat up. I expected to see teeth falling out of her mouth, but when she opened it and removed the chisel, there wasn't as much as a crack to be seen. She laughed and said, ha, you thought I'd bitten off more than I could chew. She let, she let the second volunteer go to work. The one with the smaller hammer and chisel. She warned them to be careful of her gums then let him position the chisel on her teeth and whack away at them. He nearly hammered his arm off, but he wasn't able to harm them. The third volunteer tried sawing them off with an electric saw. He, he ran the saw from one side of her mouth to the other and sparks were flying everywhere. But when he put it down and the dust cleared, Gertha's teeth were as white, gleaming and solid as ever. The twisting twins Steve and Circe came on after her. They were identical twins and they were contortionists like Alexander Ribbs. Their act involved twisting their bodies around each other so they looked like one person, with two fronts instead of a back, or two upper bodies and no legs. They were skillful and it was pretty interesting, but dull compared to the rest of the performers. When Steve and Circe were finished, Mr Tall came out and thanked us all for coming. I thought the, three, the freaks would come out again and line up in a row, but they didn't. Instead, Mr. Tall said that we could buy more stuff at the back of the hall on our way out. He asked us to mention the show to our friends. Then he thanked us again for coming and said that the show was over. I was a bit disappointed that it had ended so weakly, 
but it was late and I suppose the freaks were tired. I got to my feet, picked up the stuff I'd bought and turned to say something to Steve. He was looking behind me up at the balcony, his eyes wide. I turned to see what he was looking at and as I did, people behind us began to scream. When I looked up, I saw why. There was a huge snake up on the balcony, one of the longest I had ever seen, and it was sliding down one of the poles towards the people at the bottom. That's the end of chapter 13. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, enjoy the rest of the book, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Hello, Year Sixes. This is Mrs. Rowley here. I'm one of the uh, Spanish and French teachers that you'll get to meet uh, when you come in September. Uh, today I'm going to read chapter 14 from this book that you have been enjoying so far. So let's make a start. The snake's tongue flicked in and out of its mouth and it seemed mighty hungry. It wasn't very colourful, dark green with a few flecks of brighter colours here and there, but it looked deadly. The people beneath the balcony ran back towards their seats. They were screaming and dropping stuff off as they ran. A few people fainted and some fell and were crushed. Steve and me were lucky to be near the front. We were the smallest people in the theatre and would have been trampled to dust if we'd been caught in the rush. The snake was about to slither onto the floor when a strong light fixed itself to the snake's face. The reptile froze and stared into the light without blinking. People stopped running and the panic died down. Those who had fallen pulled themselves back to their feet and fortunately, nobody appeared to be badly hurt. There was a sound behind us. I turned to look back at the stage a boy was up there. He was about 14 or 15, very thin, with long yellowy green hair. His eyes were oddly shaped, narrow like the snake's. He was dressed in a long white robe. The boy made a hissing noise and raised his arms above his head. The robe fell away and everybody who was watching him let out a loud gasp of surprise. His body was covered in scales. From head to toe, he sparkled green and gold and yellow and blue. He was wearing a pair of shorts, but nothing else. He turned around so we could see his back, and that was the same as the front, except a few shades darker. When he faced us again, he lay down on his belly and slid off the stage, just like a snake. It was then that I remembered the snake boy on the flyer and put two and two together. He stood where he, when he reached the floor and he walked towards the back of the theatre. I saw as he passed that he had strange hands and feet. His fingers and toes were joined to each other by thin sheets of skin. He looked a bit like a monster I saw in an old horror film, the one who lived in the Black Lagoon. He stopped a few metres away from the pillar and crouched down. The light which had been blinding the snake snapped off and it began to move again, sliding down the last stretch of pole. The boy made another hissing noise and the snake paused. I recalled reading somewhere once that snakes can't hear but can feel sounds. The snake boy shuffled a short bit to the left, then his right, the snake's head followed him, but didn't lunge. The boy crept closer to the snake until he was within its reach. I expected it to strike and kill him, and I wanted to scream at him to run. But the snake boy knew what he was doing. When he was close enough, he reached out and tickled the snake beneath its chin with its odd webbed fingers. Then he bent forward and kissed it on the nose. The snake wrapped itself around the boy's neck. It coiled about about him a couple of times, leaving its tail draped over its shoulder and down its back like a scarf. The boy stroked the snake and smiled. I thought he was going to walk through the crowd, letting the rest of us rub it, 
but he didn't. Instead, he walked over to the side of the theater, away from the path to the door. He unwrapped the snake and put it down on the floor, then tickled it under his chin once more. The mouth opened wide this time, and I saw its fangs. The snake boy lay down on, its back, on his back, a short bit away from the snake, then began wriggling towards it. Oh, I said softly to myself, surely he's not going to. But yes, he stuck his head in the snake's wide open mouth. The snake boy stayed inside the mouth for a few more seconds, then slowly eased out. He wrapped the snake about him once more, then rolled around and around until the snake covered him completely, except for his face. He managed to hop to his feet and grinned. He looked like a rolled up carpet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, said Mr. Tall from the stage behind us, really is the end. He smiled and leapt from the stage, vanishing in midair in a puff of smoke. When it cleared, I saw him by the back of the theatre, holding the exit curtains open. The pretty ladies and mysterious blue hooded people were standing to the left and right, their arms loaded with trays full of goodies. I was sorry I hadn't saved some of my money. Steve said nothing while we were waiting. I could tell from the serious look on his face that he was still thinking. And from past experience, I knew there was no point talking to him. When Steve went into one of his moods, nothing could jolt him out of it. When the rows behind us had cleared out, we made our way to the back of the theatre. I brought the stuff I'd bought with me. I also lugged Steve's gifts because he was so wrapped up in his thoughts, he would have dropped them or left them behind. Mr. Tall was standing at the back, holding the curtains open, smiling at everyone. The smile widened when we approached. Well, boys, he said, did you enjoy the show? It was fabulous, I said. You weren't scared? He asked. A little, I admitted, but no more than anybody else. He laughed. You're a tough pair, he said. There were people behind us, so we hurried on, not wanting to hold them up. Steve looked about when we entered the short corridor before, between the two sets of curtains, then leaned over and whispered in my ear, Go back yourself. What? I asked, stopping. The people who had been behind us were chatting with Mr. Tall, so there was no rush. You heard, he said. Why should I? I asked. Because I'm not coming, he said. I'm staying. I don't know how things will turn out, but I have to stay. I'll follow you home later after I've... His voice trailed off and he pulled me forward. We pushed past the second set of curtains and entered the corridor with the table the one covered by the long black cloth. The people ahead of us had their backs to us. Steve looked over his shoulder to make sure nobody could see, then dived underneath the table and hid behind the cloth. Steve, I hissed, worried he was going to get us into trouble. Go on then, he, he hissed back. But you can't, I began. Do what I say, he snapped. Go quick before we're caught. I didn't like it, but what else could I do? Steve sounded like he'd go ape if I didn't obey him. I'd seen Steve get into fierce rages before and he wasn't someone you wanted to mess with when he was angry. I started walking toward the corner and began down the long corridor leading to the front door. I was walking slowly, thinking, and the people in front got further ahead. I glanced over my shoulder and still there was nobody behind me. And then I spotted the door. It was the one we'd stopped by on our way in. The only one leading up to the balcony. I paused when I reached it and checked behind one last time. Nobody there. OK, I said to myself, I'm staying. I don't know what Steve's up to, but he's my best friend. If he gets into trouble, I want to be there to help him out.
Before I could change my mind, I opened the door, slipped through, shut it quickly behind me and stood in the dark, my heart beating as fast as a mouse's. I stood there for ages, listening while the last audience filed out. I could hear their murmurs as they discussed the show in hushed, frightened, but excited tones. Then they were gone and the place was quiet. I thought I'd be able to hear noises from inside the theatre, people cleaning up and fixing the chairs back in place. But the whole building was like, was uh, sorry, it was as silent as a graveyard. I climbed the stairs. My eyes had got used to the dark and I could see pretty well. The stairs were old and creaky and as I half afraid, they would snap under my feet and send me hurtling to my death. But they held. When I reached the top, I discovered I was standing in the middle of the balcony. It was very dusty and dirty up here and cold too. I shivered as I crept down towards the front. I had a great view of the stage. The lights were still on and I could see everything in perfect detail. Nobody was about, not the freaks, not the pretty ladies, not the blue hoods, not Steve. I sat back and waited. About five minutes later, I spotted a shadow creeping slowly towards the stage. It pulled itself up, then stood and walked to the centre, where it stopped and turned around. It was Steve. He started towards the left wing, then stopped and set off towards the right. He stopped again. I could see him chewing on his nails, trying to decide which way to go. Then a voice came from high above his head. Are you looking for me? It asked. A figure swooned down onto the stage, its arms out to its sides, a long red cloak floating behind it like a pair of wings. Steve nearly jumped out of his skin when the figure hit the stage and rolled into a ball. I toppled backwards, terrified. When I rose to my knees again, the figure was standing and I was able to make out its red clothes, orange hair, pale skin and huge scar. Mr. Crixley! Steve tried speaking, but his teeth were shaking too much. I saw you watching me, Mr. Crepsley said. You gasped aloud when you first saw me. Why? But, 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 because I n n know who you are, stuttered. Steve stuttered, finding his voice. I am Larton Crepsley, the creepy looking man said. No, Steve replied. I know who you really are. Oh, Mr. Crepsley smiled, but there was no humour in it. Tell me, little boy, he sneered. Who am I, really? Your real name is Ver Horston, Steve said, and Mr. Crepsley's jaw dropped in astonishment. And then Steve said something else, and my jaw dropped too. You're a vampire, he said, and the silence which followed was as long as it was terrifying. Hello, Year 7. My name is Mrs Hunt and I'm the deputy head teacher and today I'm going to read chapter 15. Mr Crepsley, or Ver Horston, if that was his real name, smiled. So, he said, I have been discovered. I should not be surprised. It had to happen eventually. Tell me, boy, who sent you? Nobody, Steve said. Mr Crepsley frowned. Come, boy, he growled. Do not play games. Who are you working for? Who put you on to me and what do they want? I'm not working for anybody, Steve insisted. I have lots of books and magazines at home about vampires and monsters. There was a picture of you in one of them. A picture, Mr. Crepsley asked suspiciously. A painting, Steve replied. It was done in 1903 in Paris. You were with a rich woman. The story said the two of you almost married, but she found out you were a vampire and dumped you. Mr. Crepsley smiled. As good a reason as any. Her friends thought she was inventing a fantastic story to make herself look better. But it wasn't a story, was it? Steve said. No, Mr. Crepsley agreed. It was not. He sighed and fixed Steve with a fierce gaze. Though it might have been better for you if it had been, he boomed. If I had been in Steve's place, I would have fled as soon as he said that. But Steve didn't even blink. You won't hurt me, he said. Why not? Mr. Crepsley asked. Because of my friend, Steve said. I told him all about you. And if anything happens to me, he'll tell the police. They will not believe him, Mr. Crepsley snorted. Probably not, Steve agreed. 
But if I turn up dead or go missing, they'll have to investigate. You wouldn't like that. Lots of police asking questions, coming here in the daytime. Mr. Crapsley shook his head with disgust. Children, he snarled. I hate children. What is it you want? Money? Jewels? The right to publish my story? I want to join you, Steve said. I nearly fell off the balcony when I heard him. Join him? What do you mean? Mr. Crapsley asked, as stunned as I was. I want to become a vampire, Steve said. I want you to make me a vampire and teach me your ways. You are crazy, Mr. Crapsley roared. No, Steve said, I'm not. I cannot turn a child into a vampire, Mr. Crapsley said. I would be murdered by, by the vampire generals if I did. What are vampire generals? Steve asked. Never you mind, Mr. Crapsley said. All you need to know is it cannot be done. We do not blood children. It creates too many problems. So don't change me straight away, Steve said. That's okay, I don't mind waiting. I can be an apprentice. I know vampires often have assistants who are half human, half vampire. Let me be one. I'll work hard and prove myself. And when I'm old enough, Mr. Crepsey stared at Steve and thought it over. He clicked his fingers while he was thinking and a chair flew onto the stage from the front row. He sat down on it and crossed his legs. Why do you want to be a vampire? He asked. It is not much fun. We can only come out at night. Humans despise us. We have to sleep in dirty old places like this. We can never marry or have children or settle down. It is a horrible life. I don't care, Steve said stubbornly. Is it because you want to live forever? Mr. Crepsley asked. If so, I must tell you, we do not. We live far longer than humans, but we die all the same, sooner or later. I don't care, Steve said again. I want to come with you. I want to learn. I want to become a vampire. What about your friends? Mr. Crapsley asked. You would not be able to see them again. You would have to leave school and home and never return. What about your parents? Would you not miss them? Steve shook his head miserably and looked down at the floor. My dad doesn't live with us, he said softly. I hardly ever see him. And my mum doesn't love me. She doesn't care what I do. She probably won't even notice I'm gone. That is why you want to run away? Because your mother does not love you? Partly, Steve said. If you wait a few years, you'll be old enough to leave by yourself, Mr. Crapsley said. I don't want to wait, Steve replied. And your friends? Mr. Crapsley asked again. He looked quite kind at that moment, though still a bit scary. Would you miss the boy you came with tonight? Darren? Steve asked, then nodded. Yes, I'll miss my friends, Darren especially, but it doesn't matter. I want to be a vampire more than I care about them. And if you don't accept me, I'll tell the police and become a vampire hunter when I grow up. Mr. Crepsley didn't laugh. Instead, he nodded seriously. You have thought this through, he asked. Yes, Steve said. You are certain it is what you want? Yes, came the answer. Mr. Crepsley took a deep breath. Come here, he said. I will have to test you first. Steve stood beside Mr. Crepsley. His body blocked my view of the vampire, so I couldn't see what happened next. All I know is they spoke to each other very softly. Then there was a noise like a cat lapping up milk. I saw Steve's back shaking and I thought he was going to fall over, but somehow he managed to stay upright. I can't even begin to tell you how frightened I was watching this. I wanted to leap to my feet and cry out, no, Steve, stop. But I was too scared to move. Terrified that if Mr. Crapsey knew I was here, there would be nothing to stop him from killing and eating both me and Steve. All of a sudden, the vampire began coughing. He pushed Steve away from him and stumbled to his feet. To my horror, I saw his mouth was red, covered in blood, which he quickly spat out. What's wrong? Steve asked, rubbing his arm where he had fallen. You have bad blood, Mr. Crapsey screamed. What do you mean? Steve, Steve asked. His voice was trembling. You are evil. Mr. Crepsley shouted. I can taste the menace in your blood. You are savage. That's a lie, Steve yelled. You take that back. Steve ran at Mr. Crepsley and tried to punch him, but the vampire knocked him to the floor with one hand. It is no good, he growled. Your blood is bad. You can never be a vampire. Why not? Steve asked. He had started to cry. Because vampires are not the evil monsters of lore, Mr. Crepsley said. We respect life. You have a killer's instincts, but we are not killers. I will not make you a vampire, Mr. Crapsley insisted. You must forget about it. Go home and get on with your life. 
No, Steve screams. I won't forget. He stumbles to his feet and pointed a shaking finger at the tall, ugly vampire. I'll get you for this, he promised. I don't care how long it takes. One day, Verhorsten, I'll track you down and kill you for rejecting me. Steve jumped from the stage and ran towards the exit. One day, he called back over his shoulder, and I could hear him laughing as he ran, a crazy kind of laugh. Then he was gone, and I was alone with the vampire. Mr. Crepsley sat where he was for a long time, his head between his hands, spitting bits of blood out onto the stage. He wiped his teeth with his fingers, then with a large handkerchief chief. Children, he snorted aloud, then stood, still wiping his teeth, glanced one last time out over the chairs at the theatre. I ducked down low for fear he might spot me, then turned and walked back to the wings. I could see drops of blood dripping from his lips as he went. I stayed where I was for a long, long time. It was tough. I'd never been as scared as I was up there on the balcony. I wanted to rush out of the theatre as fast as my feet would carry me, but I stayed. I made myself wait until I was sure none of the freaks or helpers were about, then slowly crept up the balcony, down the stairs, into the corridor, and finally out into the night. I stood outside the theatre for a few seconds, staring up at the moon, studying the trees until I was sure there were no vampires lurking on any of the branches. Then, as quietly as I could, I raced for home. My home, not Steve's. I didn't want to be ne near Steve right then. I was almost as scared of Steve as I was of Mr. Crepsley. I mean, he wanted to be a vampire. What sort of lunatic actually wants to be a vampire? Hello, Year 7. My name is Miss Bell and I am an English teacher and second in the English department. I'm going to be reading Chapter 16 of Cirque du Freak for you today. So Chapter 16. I didn't ring Steve that Sunday. I told mum and dad we'd had a bit of an argument and that's why I come home early. They weren't happy about it, especially my having walked home so late at night by myself. Dad said he was going to dock my pocket money and was grounding me if I didn't argue. The way I saw it, I was getting off lightly. Imagine what they'd have done to me if they knew about the Cirque du Freak. Annie rubbed her presence. She gobbled the candy down quick and played with the spider for hours. She made me tell her all about the show. She wanted to know what every freak looked like and what they'd done. Her eyes went wide when I told her about the wolf man and how he bit off a woman's arm. You're joking, she said. That can't be true. It is, I vowed. Cross your heart, she yeah, asked. Cross my heart. Swear on your eyes. I swear on my eyes, I promised. May rats gnaw them out if I'm telling a lie. Wow, she gasped. I wish I'd been there. If you ever go again, will you take me? Sure, I said. But I don't think the freak show comes here that often. They move around a lot. I didn't tell Annie about Mr. Creepsley being a vampire or Steve wanting to become one. But I thought about the two of them all day long. I wanted to ring Steve, but I didn't know what to say. He was bound to ask why I didn't go back to his place, and I didn't want to tell him that I'd stayed in the theatre and spied on him. Imagine a real-life vampire. I used to believe they were real, but then my parents and teachers convinced me they weren't. So much for the wisdom of grown-ups. I wondered what vampires were really like, and whether they could do everything the books and films said they could. I had seen Mr. Creepsy make a chair fly, and I'd seen him swoop down from the roof of the theatre, and I'd seen him drink some of Steve's blood. What else could he do? Could he turn into a bat, into smoke, into a rat? Could you see him in a mirror? Would sunlight kill him? As much as I thought about Mr. Creepsy, I thought just as much about Madame Octa. I wished once again and that I could buy one like her, one that I could control. I could join a freak show if I had a spider like that and travel the world having marvellous adventures. Sunday came and went. I watched TV, helped Dad in the garden and Mum in the kitchen, part of my punishment for coming home late by myself. Went for a long walk in the afternoon and daydreamed about vampires and spiders. 
Then it was Monday and time for school. I was nervous going in, not sure what I was going to say to Steve or what he might say to me. Also, I hadn't slept much over the weekend. It's hard to sleep when you've seen a real vampire. So I was tired and groggy. Steve was in the yard when I arrived, which was unusual. I normally got to school before him. He was standing apart from the rest of the kids waiting for me. I took a deep breath, then walked over and leaned against the wall beside him. Morning, I said. Morning, he replied. There were dark circles under his eyes, and I bet he'd slept even less than me the last couple of nights. Where did you get to after the show? He asked. I went home, I told him. Why? He asked, watching me carefully. It was dark outside and I wasn't looking where I was going. I took a few wrong turns and got lost. By the time I found myself somewhere familiar, I was closer to home than your house. I made the lie sound as convincing as possible and I could see him trying to figure out if it was the truth or not. You must have got into a lot of trouble, he said. Tell me about it, I groaned. No pocket money, grounded for a month. And Dad says I'm going to have to do loads of chores. Still, said with a grin, it was worth it, right? I mean, was the Cirque du Freak superb or what? Steve studied me for one more moment, then decided I was telling the truth. Yeah, he said, returning my smile. It was great. Tommy and Alan arrived and we had to tell them everything. We were pretty good actors, Steve and me. You'd never have guessed that he had spoken to a vampire on Friday or that I had seen him. I could tell as the day wore on that things would never be quite the same between me and Steve. Even though he believed what I told him, part of him still doubted me. I caught him looking at me oddly from time to time as though I was someone who had hurt him. For my part, I didn't want to get too close to him any longer. It scared me what he had said to Mr. Crapesley and what the vampire had said to him. Steve was evil, according to Mr. Creepsley. It worried me. After all, Steve was prepared to become a vampire and kill people for their blood. How could I go on being friends with someone like that? We got chatting about Madame Motta later that afternoon. Steve and me hadn't said much about Mr. Creepsley and his spouse. We were afraid to talk about him in case we let something slip. But Tommy and Alan kept pestering us and eventually we filled them in on the act. How do you think he controlled that spider, Tommy asked. Maybe it was a fake spider, Alan said. It wasn't a fake, I snorted. None of the freaks were fake. That's why it's so brilliant. You could tell everything was real. So... How did he control it? Tommy asked. Maybe the loot is magic, I said. Or else Mr. Creepsley knows how to charm spiders the way Indians can charm snakes. You said that Mr. Tall controlled the spider as well, Alan said, when Mr. Creepsley had Madame Octa in his mouth. Oh, yeah, I forgot, I said. Well, I guess that means they must have used magic flutes. They didn't use magic flutes, Steve said. He had been very quiet most of the day, saying less than me about the show. But Steve never, never resist hammering someone with facts. So what did he use? I asked. Telepathy, Steve answered. Is that something to do with telephones? Alan asked. Steve smiled and Tommy and me laughed, although I wasn't entirely sure what telepathy meant. And I bet Tommy wasn't either. Moron, Tommy chuckled and punched Alan playfully. Go on, Steve, I said. Tell him what it means. Telepathy is when you can read someone's mind, Steve explained. Or send them thoughts without speaking. That's how they control the spider, with their minds. So what's with the flutes, I asked. Either they're just for show, Steve said. Or, more likely... You need them to attract her attention. You mean anyone could control her, Tommy asked. Anyone with a brain, yes, Steve said. Which counts you out, Alan, he added, but smiled to show he didn't mean it.
You wouldn't need magic flutes or special training or anything, Tommy asked. I wouldn't think so, Steve answered. The talk moved on to something else after that. Football, I think, but I wasn't listening. Because all of a sudden, there was a new thought running through my mind, setting my brain on fire with ideas. I forgot about Steve and vampires and everything. You mean anyone could control her? Anyone with a brain? Yes. You wouldn't need magic flutes or special training or anything? I wouldn't imagine so. Tommy and Steve's words kept bouncing through my mind over and over like a stuck CD. Anyone could control her. That anyone could be me. If I could get my hands on Madame Octa and communicate with her, she could be my pet and I could control her and... No, it was foolish. Maybe I could control her, but I would never own her. She was Mr. Creepsley's, and there was no way in the world that he would part with her, not for money, or jewels, or... The answer hit me in a flash. A way to get her off him. A way to make her mine. Blackmail. If I threatened the vampire, I could say I'd set the police on him, and he'd have to let me keep her. But the thought of going face to face with Mr. Creepsley terrified me. I knew I couldn't do it. That left just one other option. I'd have to steal her 